Welcome to War Room, the official podcast of the U.S. Army War College Online Journal, graciously supported by the Army War College Foundation. Please join the conversation at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. We hope you enjoy the program. You can subscribe to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast, at iTunes, Google Play, or your favorite download service, and never miss the great content we offer. Hello, and welcome to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast. I'm Jacqueline Witt, Professor of Strategy at the U.S. Army War College and the Editor-in-Chief of War Room. Thanks so much for joining us today. For the third year in a row, I am pleased to host the UK half of the Kermit Roosevelt Exchange Lecture Series, which brings an officer from the Royal Army over to the United States, and we send one of ours to the UK for a series of engagements and lectures. The exchange began in 1947, and this year marks the program's 74th year. It is a good annual marker of the close relationship between the UK and the United States and it provides an excellent opportunity to hear about perspectives on senior and strategic leadership from a different vantage point. So today I'm joined by General Tim Radford, who commissioned into the Light Infantry in 1985 and has since commanded on operations in Northern Ireland, Sierra Leone, Iraq, and Afghanistan. In 2009, he served in the Ministry of Defense as the head of overseas operations. After this, he was promoted to Major General and deployed to Afghanistan as the Chief of Staff of NATO's ISAF Joint Command. Since then, he has held a variety of other assignments, including the Deputy Commander of NATO's Operation Resolute Support, also in Afghanistan. He then commanded the Allied Rapid Reaction Corps from July 2016 to July 2019. And this month, April of 2020, he will assume the appointment as Deputy Supreme Allied Commander Europe, or DSACUR. So, General Radford, welcome to the War Room. Jackie, thank you. It's very good to be here. All right. So I'd like to start with the question that we ask everyone that's part of this series, which is to tell us about the strategic leaders or the senior leaders, um, military or civilian, who you admire most. Well, I think, Jackie, there are some some obvious ones which um, I have been taught about over the years, you know, the Clausewitz, the Little Hearts. Um, but, but I think one who perhaps might be relevant um, for my next appointment uh, is is a, a man called George F. Kennan. Now, Kennan, uh, as you're probably aware, an American Foreign Service officer in 1925, and he went over to, to Moscow to work in the embassy, and he immersed himself in, in Russian culture. And he was there during the Stalinist purges, and he gained a strong understanding of about all things Russia. Um, and then in 1946, he, he sent a telegram back to uh, Washington talking about the importance of uh, our, the, the US approach to, to the Soviet Union. And from that telegram, he was recalled to work as part of the wise men, Truman's wise men. And really from, from that understanding of the S- Soviet policy and the fact that the roots of Soviet uh, philosophy were really quite small, came the eventual uh, policy uh, of containment for the Cold War. And really, he is a a little known uh, person in terms of of stature in many respects. But but Kennan, to my mind, was one of the key people that shaped the US policy uh, and indeed the the rest of the West Mm -hmm. policy on, on, on Soviet war. Sure, we spend we spend a lot of time talking about the long telegram about Kennan. I like to remind war college students that Kennan was forty four years old right. when he when he wrote the long telegram. Yeah, um, and so that could be right. That could be that could be them. Um, what is it that you imagine Kennan sort of took from his study of of history of being in Moscow? Are those things that that you think would enable? other people to do something similar or was Kennan sort of a anomaly or once in a lifetime brain? Uh, difficult to say, but I, th- I think what Kennan did was he, he um, because of his understanding of the Soviet culture, was able to interpret and then relate to the future. And as a strategic thinker, it needs to be able, you know, the, the, the most important thing is to have that vision and understanding of what, mm-hmm. what, what, where, where the threats are and therefore how you need to change change strategy. But I think that policy, which which I was really pleased to, to understand later on, to, to read later on, was done in conjunction with a British man called Frank Roberts. Mm-hmm. 
um, reinforcing the, the, the idea of a special relationship. Um, I think it's something that in the past sometimes we forget that the, the importance of understanding the, the opposition that we face. So we, we've seen that on numerous occasions where it takes a while for us to really understand the, the enemy that we're fighting. Right. So um, I think it was an, a really important um, uh, time in, in, in history and, and it was such an influential part of, of our shaping of, of our response to the Cold War. That was one. Um, and then if I may, uh, from, a, from a British perspective, there is one other who, who uh, has always been a favorite of mine. And, and although it slightly spans the operational to strategic, is a man called Colin Gubbins who was responsible for leading at one point the Special Operations Executive during the Second World War, where he uh, talked, and uh, I talked about that at the, uh, at the, uh, the Kermit Roosevelt lecture. And, and what he did was he brought this uh, eclectic mix of people together, men and women who parachuted into France to help the resistance. And his vision, a strategic vision, um, having seen, a, uh, if you like, a gap in the market, was he was able to turn this force into a something that could create incredible strategic effect through um, clandestine activity linking in with the in, in place forces. Mm -hmm. And so both of these, they're sort of different approaches, right? There's yeah. this sort of academic intellectual yeah, exactly. deep knowledge approach that Kennan had and then the um, clandestine, the team building the sort of uh, achieving effects approach. Yeah, I think that's absolutely accurate. Yeah. Uh, and and both of those, but both of those forward-looking and visionary in their own in their own way. But I think there's also an element of the fact that that Kennan was was focusing on non-military, talking about economy, mm -hmm. economics, and, poli and and politics, whereas Gubbins was purely tactical in right. a, in respect. Sure. As you get ready to take on a new a new job um, as the deputy sacker. What are the things that are on your mind about what the what the future might bring, what challenges you might face, or what are the um, what are the things you're anticipating as you as you start a new a new role? Um, well, I've had the the, the privilege of, of working in, in NATO appointments in the past, and um, you know one of the key things is making sure that we keep the alliance um, coherent and the cohesion of the alliance. You know, the 29 soon to be 30 nations to make sure that uh, we we have uh, a a group of nations that will work together and work for each other. There, there, are, there are the obvious threats which are out there at the moment from uh, Russia, from terrorism, um, and from uh, you know the, 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 the need to harness technology for the future, um, to master um, automation, to master uh, AI, um, and to, to develop technically uh, as best we can uh, so that we get a competitive advantage. And I think also um, over the next few years, we need to be sure that we relearn in many respects the, the art of deterrence, um, which in, in many respects over the last few years and the, the, the last 15 or so years of combat um, in Afghanistan and Iraq in particular, um, we, we may not be as well versed in as we have been in the past. Mm. And especially, I imagine, thinking about how you deter uh, the Russians in, in Europe, but also how we might deter terrorist organizations. Thinking about deterrence more broadly is an interesting way to frame some of the, some of the problems to prevent having to fight. Exactly. And, and I think, uh, you know, make, it, make sure that deterrence and defense of the, of the Euro-Atlantic Alliance in particular is relevant for the 21st century. Right. This question about the Euro-Atlantic Alliance and the role uh, that Europe plays, the role that the UK plays, the role that the US plays, all of this has felt maybe a bit in flux in the past uh, few years as political developments in the United States and the UK and in Europe more broadly uh, have sort of brought some of these challenges, I think, to the to the forefront. This brings to mind um, maybe one of the potential tensions that you might see, which is that you are you're a UK army officer, uh, but also in a NATO post, right? And how how do we balance the sort of different identities that might be required uh, to do to do those sorts of things? Okay, well, I mean, first and foremost, I am a NATO, <laughs> a NATO officer in a, in a NATO post, so so that is that is um, my my role, um, and as as with every other NATO officer, you know, you 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 have a background and you have a history which which shapes you. Um, I, I will obviously have close links to the, to the UK, um, but but I'm essentially a NATO officer, you know, on, working on behalf of the Secretary General um, and also the the SACA. 
throughout your career, as you've moved through the ranks of, of being a general officer, um, my guess is you've worked with lots of colonels. You were once yourself a colonel. Um, what in your mind is it that separates the very best colonels from, from the rest? So um, I, I have, as you say, uh, had the privilege of working um, with some extremely good colonels, um, particularly uh, down range, as you would say. And um, you know, my, my abiding memory of colonels is, is that they really are the, the pivot between the, the engine room and the ultimate decision makers, particularly, for example, in a core headquarters. And I was always struck, um, you know, particularly in Afghanistan, the power of the council of colonels and how a commander, and indeed a deputy commander, would, re would rely on their judgment. So, so I suppose what, what distinguishes them, the, the best ones really are, are the best leaders that you can get. To my mind, in many respects, it's about leadership. It's about eliciting the best from your subordinates, about giving them credit, about gaining the trust of the commander, about speaking truth to power when it's required. And I think also identifying the kernel of an issue as it, as it comes up. You know, we're short of time uh, often on operations. So being able to, to build that team, identify that kernel of a, of a problem, and then be able to give clear, unambiguous advice to a commander is what, it's, what is important. Um, so I think that's, that would be my, my comments on that. Right. So as you think about the, the challenges of leadership, about building teams, working with subordinates, making difficult decisions, as you move into this new role and you think about or reflect on past challenges, yeah. could you walk us through uh, briefly a challenge that you faced in the past, uh, making a difficult decision or facing a difficult problem and sort of how you approached it and how that might inform your decision making going forward? When I think back on recent strategic issues that I've had to deal with, um, I suppose I reflect on one in Afghanistan in particular, where over a, a, a period of time, uh, we were trying to look forward and work out how the Resolute Support Mission would, would go uh, forward. And, you know, we had this di slight dilemma where we had um, a US view that was um, hard charging and going forward and creating Shocking. A, yeah. <laughs> an extremely impressive um, uh, answer to, to, to a problem, but it was going very fast. We, we had a, a, a NATO um, series of ideas which were going a little slower. Um, and I had said to General Campbell at the time that let me, let me take this on and I will try and bring the two together. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that in that environment was, was a challenge because people wanted to move quickly. Um, but in fact, the most important thing was to make sure that we did it coherently and together, Moving both together. as a US and an, a, a NATO um, plan. And so over a period of time, um, based on logic um, analysis, and particularly dialogue, and ultimately consensus, we managed to bring the two together. Um, so that by the time we briefed it back into Brussels, um, myself and the US commander were able to go back and, and do a joint, uh, a joint plan together. So I think when I, when I reflect back, you know, what I learned from that was the importance of, of planning, uh, particularly of dialogue, even though it's difficult, um, and making sure that you, you emerge, however, however difficult that might be with a joint plan. What, what would you imagine are the skills that someone would need to develop to lead that kind of dialogue or, or discussion? Well, uh, the ability to listen, to start off with, um, some patience, um, and then from uh, perhaps from an, another side, uh, you know, the ability to compromise. Mm -hmm. um, because in order to, in, in this world that we live in of coalitions, um, it is vitally important um, to compromise, uh, to make sure that you can get consensus. As you think about the work that you've done with NATO in coalitions, um, with European partners, with American partners, what are the most important um, considerations for the for the coalition going forward are there questions that the coalition should be asking are there threats that the coalition maybe needs to reassess um what does the world look like if you're looking at it from a nato point of view i think uh at, at jackie at the moment that that um there are many many initiatives that are going on uh, in nato all really positive um and i think 
one of the most important things is to make sure that the, 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 the chiefs of defence and the nations, uh, the troop contributing nations to the coalition, um, understand the clarity of, 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 of the direction of travel, the vision, um, the objectives that are trying to be achieved, and the, the logic behind the, the strategies and um, the, the policies that are taking place and being developed. And if you can do that and explain it, then I think um, you, you will find that people will support uh, what NATO is trying mm -hmm. to do. I mean, there are so many initiatives going on, but they're all very, very positive and moving in the right direction, particularly in relation to readiness and response. Sure. Do you think, are there places where there is more divergence than convergence? Are there specific issues that might require extra special attention or care over the next few years? I'll let you know in, a, in okay. about a month's time, if that's <laughs> sounds, all right. Sounds good. You can come back come back Thank to Carlo <laughs> any, any time you'd like. Thank you. Um, if, if I ask you to take off the NATO hat for a moment yeah. and put on a UK hat uh, and think about things from that perspective, um, all militaries are constantly sort of thinking about what's next, uh, assessing and thinking about the future. If you think about the the UK and its military force, what are the major challenges uh, that you see it facing in the next five or 10 years? Uh, and how's the country preparing for that? Um, the challenges will be the same as every other member of NATO. Um, but, you know, our Prime Minister launched on the 26th of February, uh, announced an, an integrated review of security, defense, development and foreign policy. Um, this and it's the it's the sort of biggest review um, since the Cold War, mm. uh, and and the aim of that really is to reassess Britain's place in the world, and, and it will do a number of things. I think it'll define for the future the UK role um, in terms of long term strategic aims, um, how and uh, who and prioritised view of who we're going to work with in terms of allies. It will almost certainly talk to capabilities and risks. Um, and it will talk to how we're going to have to restructure our, our, our military. Um, so I think, you know, we're, we're in this process of, of um, analysis. Uh, and I think by the summer of this year, we will be in a much clearer place to answer that question. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, we've had a, a degree of uncertainty over the last three years with Brexit. Now we have got through that. Um, you know, we're very positive about the future. Good. When you think about the world, um, sort of from from London, I guess with a, with a, the UK, yeah. uh, sort of looking out, um, what are some of the the things that the United Kingdom is thinking about in terms of its global role in terms of global challenges, global threats? Uh, what's the what's the view look like? There are obvious threats in terms of you know the the, the current revanchist Russia. We we'll be interested to see how the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative develops. Um, there is obvious obvious threat from from Iran and and um, domestic and international terrorism are the obvious things. But I think there's also, from a military perspective, uh, the need to look at how the world will change. You know, the development of technology, hypersonic missiles, which will mm -hmm. render geographic buffer zones frankly irrelevant. From a UK perspective, also we are concerned about an ecological tipping point and climate change. And I, I think then there's the obvious things such as urbanization of, of, of mega cities and how do we fight there and, and uh, contain there if we need to. Um, so I think there are, there are myriad problems and myriad threats out there that we face. Uh, and really, as I go back to this, this point about the integrated review, that will seek to address those mm -hmm. as we go forward. What, what is the role of the army in, in all of this? Um, in an island country, right? The army can defend, should defend, um, but it's also been used in an expeditionary way for a very, very long time. It has. Um, is that is that something that is up for discussion or in the in the water at all? You know, we, we, we will continue to do what we have done, which is preserve the stability and security of our nation, and also, particularly from now on, um, be a a. Uh, member of NATO um, that will contribute and our you know we are moving into an era of you know one of your sec your, your previous sec Secretary of State for Defense Secretary Atson called us no longer a global power but a regional power well I, I would argue differently um, that I think you know global Britain is still extremely relevant mm -hmm. not least through the 53 nations that make up our Commonwealth 
um, which is uh, gives us um, a, a 20% co cover. It's a political grouping, but it covers 20% <laughs> of the globe. So um, you know, this is a, this is a global footprint, um, which is extremely important. Not 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 least because of the people that uh, Her Majesty the Queen mm -hmm. is responsible for, but also because it also offers an opportunity for, for global reach. So um, I, I don't see us being constrained necessarily to, to being in the UK. Okay, very good. Um, I've got sort of one more, one more question that sure. I'd like to, to sort of wrap up with, mm. which is really about how you have managed your career, uh, the balancing of personal and professional questions and, and things like that, um, that you are an officer, but also, right, also a, a human being. Um, and we talk a lot about, in the U.S., it's work-life balance, and yeah. how do we <clears throat> ensure that we're remaining mentally, physically, um, right, relationally sort of fit. Yeah. So could you talk a, a little bit about your own um, sort of professional development and personal development and how you, how you manage um, your schedule, your time? Right. Okay. Uh, I thought we were going somewhere else there, but oh. that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. Uh, my yeah. My my own time. Um. Well, I I'm I'm a, I'm an, a lark, not an owl. So I I tend to do early mornings rather than late evenings. Um. So I, you know, I will do PT in the morning, um, and then I will try and manage my day. Um. You know, based on a, you know, my my day is not routine. Mm -hmm. So you know whether I, if I, whether I'm in command or in staff, you know I, I I tend to probably do my best work in the morning um, and in the in the middle of the afternoon, but then by the evening I, I tend not to. Yeah, no, I understand. I understand that is my um, my pattern as well. I'm about to hit my afternoon <laughs> slide into into oblivion. Um, is there a book you're reading right now that you would recommend? to uh, our readers or listeners, I suppose, of the podcast or something that you've read recently? Yes. Well, I mean, I, I suppose the, the, the most recent one is, is a book by someone called Sean McFate called Goliath, which is a, a very interesting look at the future. Um, and uh, it slightly throws the, throws the rule book out, out of the window. And uh, I really recommend that. Um, the second one, I, I would say, is probably Prisoners of Geography by Tim Marshall. Uh, which looks at some, uh, perhaps in a way that that military people, unless you're an engineer, wouldn't look at. Mm -hmm. um, which is a, which is a good read. Um, so I think I would suggest tho those two, Jackie. Great, I will add them to my ever-growing and never <laughs> okay. never-ending uh, reading list, and we'll make sure. I'm sure our listeners will uh, will do the same. Uh, General Radford, I would like to thank you so much uh, for joining me today on the on the war room podcast it's been a real pleasure talking with you uh thank you for coming and speaking to the war college class and best of luck in your in your new role is there anything you'd like to leave our listeners with i'll let you have the last word um just to say it's been an enormous privilege to be back here at the war college uh, and uh i hope very much um, on the back of of everything that we have done in the past uh, together that this special in re special relationship endures and then we continue to work uh, closely together. Okay, great. So for War Room, this is Jackie Witt signing off. Thank you, Jackie. And that concludes our program. Thank you for listening. The views expressed in this podcast reflect those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views, policies, or positions of the U.S. Army or the Department of Defense. Let us know what you think. Provide us your feedback, comments, or suggestions through our webpage at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. And have a great day.